I am delighted to be here today. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, today's talk is also going to include how open source in general can accelerate national ad innovation agendas. And before I go too far, I just want to give a brief uh, introduction to myself. And it's probably worth mentioning at this point in time that I am neither an open source developer nor have I been involved in open source very long. So I am a recent convert to the whole open source movement. Um, but I'm hoping that as I share my journey of how I was converted and how I'm hoping to convert others, that there might be something useful for people. Um, and I probably should also say that I'm still on this journey and I would really welcome anyone who has feedback um, about how I can improve this journey or in fact, help me help others uh, come on the same journey. So that's, that's my goal with today. And when I was thinking about the idea of uh, national innovation agendas, that's really where I came from when I started thinking about open source. So for a long time, I have been involved in Ireland's uh, Technology Ireland Innovation Forum. And that group is all about the idea of how do we actually accelerate innovation in Ireland. And it was through other, other uh, ways that I actually came across a lot of folks in the open source and in fact, the inner source community. And then after a while, I was kind of thinking, hey, why aren't people in Ireland talking more about this? Because it seems to me that when you look at the agenda for national innovation, and I've, I've pulled out some of the topics that are involved in Ireland's uh, national innovation papers that, that come from our Department for Business, Enterprise and Innovation. And I'm pretty sure that these will be very similar topics um, that other national agendas, innovation agendas may have. But the idea that we want to accelerate R&D, that we want to accelerate the impact of R&D in enterprise, that we want to think about how education can drive innovation, that we want to think about social and economic development and how innovation can impact both of those. We want to think about transfer of knowledge and we want to think about global collaboration. And when I think about these themes and I think about what open source can provide, um, I'm thinking that there are a lot of ways in which open source can actually help. So let's look at how. From my perspective, the first thing is of course, the accelerated R&D. Now for me, one of the main benefits that everyone knows about that from an open source perspective is that it just speeds things up, right? If you don't have to reinvent the wheel, if you can take best practices that have already been tried and tested, that hundreds or maybe even thousands of developers have used already, well, why would you start from scratch? This is the prime reason why open source has become so popular. So it accelerates research and development if people can actually take code that's already been written. And we also know that these days in the open source world, there has been a lot of focus in various different industry verticals and how the open source, open source can actually drive those, uh, those industries these days. But not only that, because a recent report from McKinsey shows that, not, that, that open source development doesn't just speed up the actual building of, of code, but the practices themselves can accelerate developer velocity. So regardless about the fact that you're just assembling pre, you know, components or modules that you found out there or in GitHub or whatever, even the practices of open source can actually speed up innovation. And what they found, McKinsey found, was that actually the companies that were engaging in open source practices and both contributing from an open source perspective to uh, open source projects, but also just using the practices, like for example, in inner source, where you take open source practices and use them within, inside a firewall, both of those things actually speeds up um, development and speeds up developer velocity. So it seems to me that for, if you want to accelerate R&D, why wouldn't you go with inner source, with open source? And the second thing is around this idea of enterprise impact. So for me, again, if you're trying to do enterprise collaborations or corporate collaborations, one of the easiest ways to do that and to remove all the friction that might be might come with the idea of IP licensing and thinking about that is to do it through open source. And what we're seeing these days is the rise of many um, industry vertical groups that are actually focused on the very specific problems of industry and solving them together. And that kind of coopetition is happening across the board. Finos is a, is a great example of that, where you've got lots of fintech companies and banks who are all coming together to collaborate on common banking problems. And actually, 
uh, and actually be able to use their internal teams when they're thinking about differentiating, they can all differentiate differently. But for the common problems, they're all collaborating. So again, if we're thinking about how R&D can actually accelerate impact in enterprise, then one of the best things to do is to think about open source. And of course, we also know that there's a huge skills gap when it comes to developers in particular, sorry, I should say developers in general, and open source developers in particular. So when we think about how national agendas can help industry, then one of the things they can and should do is think about how can we fill the jobs that are out there with skilled open source and potentially inner source developers, which brings us to the third point, the idea of skills for the future and education. When I think about um, how universities or, or national agendas, when we think about education, can actually increase innovation in a country, then we have to think about the skills that we're actually giving to our citizens in order to enable them to actually participate in the global tech ecosystem. And as I mentioned earlier, when we think about open source, it's not just the skills to be able to participate with it within open source communities and projects, but the very nature of open source collaboration can help developers actually build a broader set of skills, things like conflict resolution, community development, you know, understanding the legals and compliance issues. Many of these skills are broader than just tech skills, and they can really help round out um, anyone involved in the tech industry. And so for me, that's a really key set of skills that from a national perspective, we should be thinking about giving to everyone involved in technology. And then this idea of social and economic impact. Well, it's been proven with recent studies that uh, the economic impact of open source can be quite significant. So there's a chap called Frank Nagel, who's done a lot of research in this area. And when you look at his reports, he shows that he can measure it on a national perspective, from a national perspective, that for every 1% of increase in GitHub contributions that a nation makes, you get increases across a wide variety of areas, things like the numbers of ventures that are actually created, things like the number of financing deals that are happening in the country, things like the number of acquisitions that are happening in the country, things like the, 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 the number of mission-oriented ventures that are actually being started up in a country. So there is a direct correlation between having open source and promoting open source in your country and having an economic impact in terms of the indigenous kind of uh, organizations that are being started up. But not only that, there is also the potential for a lot more social impact when we think about how we translate research, not only on a path of IP monetization or licensing, but also taking the things that are going to be for social good and bringing them out into the open and allowing for, for people in the, the actual people who will be using the software to engage with that and to build trust around those sort of things. And I'll tell you a story about that in a little while. And then this idea of knowledge transfer. Well, when I read something like knowledge transfer, I'm thinking that's made for open source. I mean, the whole point about being open in how you work and how you deliver um, the output of your research helps with knowledge transfer. I was uh, listening to one university researcher and he was describing how he has been frustrated by some of the research that he's seen published in magazines, whereby they say, and there was software uh, created to test this and uh, it's there, but there was no link to it. There was no way to actually test it out. There was no way to verify that research by running that code. When we think about the, the the necessary uh, levels that we want to get to in science where we verify what people, what researchers are doing, we need to think about software being accessible so that uh, research results can be verified and repeated and built upon. So when we think about knowledge transfer in the context of an R&D ecosystem, we really need to think about open source. And then the last thing was international collaboration. And in my book, there is no better way to facilitate international collaboration from an R&D perspective than by the use of, of open source. Uh, I, was, I heard uh, Saeed Chowdhury, who is the director of Johns Hopkins University, talking about his collaborations with the city of Paris. 
And they've actually taken some of the city services that Paris created um, in an open source project called Lutece, and they've helped implement those for the city of Baltimore. And it's an amazing collaboration and it's fantastic to see it happening. But Saeed mentioned that if he had not been able to collaborate through open source, that collaboration would, would probably be still stuck in legal wranglings about how we actually get code and, and license code across borders and across universities and, in, and institutions. So when we think about facilitating international collaboration, the best way to do that is through these recognized constructs like open source that where people can freely collaborate without worrying about individual license agreements that they have to actually negotiate. And of course, particularly in Europe at any rate, and I'm sure this is the same across the world, many research institutions now are actually getting much more favorable policies in terms of open source. So lots of the large research institutions, as I said, in Europe, at any rate, people like CERN or the National Space uh, Telescope, even in terms of various different uh, organizations, they're all looking to open source to help them accelerate what they're doing. So if we want to collaborate with them, we also have to be in the open source game, per se. So for me, when I think about accelerating a national innovation agenda, it turns out that open source is kind of essential for that. It, it, you have to do it in order to be able to go as fast as you can in all of these areas. So it's kind of a no brainer. Um, but I do think that actually some of the conversations around open source in Ireland at any rate, um, there are some still perhaps outdated ideas and narratives around open source that stop people who are involved in innovation policies and agendas and um, understanding or, or getting on board with the idea that open source can be an accelerator for this. So the next thing I'm going to cover is this idea of how are we talking about open source now. I don't probably like the, none of this is new to most of the people at all things open I know that everyone here is probably an advocate of open source probably has heard these arguments many times. I'm hoping that by putting them out like this, it, it helps kind of remind everyone about the strength of it. Um, but I do think that when we think about the conversations that we are having outside the open source ecosystem, it is important to think about what conversations we have with whom for best effect in order to bring forward the open source agenda. And I want to first of all, tell you a story about Ireland and one of the things that really has shifted the idea in Ireland quite a lot. And above and beyond the, the points that I laid out there around innovation and how we create innovative solutions, one of the main points for me around innovation agendas is actually not the creation of the innovation, but it's the adoption of the innovation. And again, open source for me plays a key part in building the trust that's required for citizens and other folk to be able to adopt technology. And when I think about digital transformation and everyone's got a digital transformation agenda, so often the success of a digital transformation agenda is more dependent on people's ability to adopt technology than it is on our ability to create it. In Ireland, there was a prime example of that. Back in March, we had the same kind of pandemic situation as everyone else around the world. And at that time, our health service executive were looking for a track and trace technology that would help the effort in terms of combating COVID. And they decided to build an app and uh, it went through some iterations in terms of looking at best practices around the world. But during the development of that app, it was decided that it really had to be open source in order for privacy advocates and experts to be able to look at the source code and make sure that it was trustworthy because that trust was so essential in terms of actually encouraging the citizens of Ireland to download and use this app. So they did that. They, they, they made the, the source code public before the launch of the app. And as a result, all the privacy experts gave it a thumbs up, which is fantastic. Um, and the numbers of people who downloaded and installed that app were out of this world. So they were completely blown away. I think something like 33% of the population had downloaded it within the first week, which was far and above the, the best result of any app of its kind in the world. So I think when we think about trust and we think about 
innovation in the context of how people are using technology, it provides one of the, the best um, benefits for open source when we, think, when we think about how it can be used at a national level. Um, and I, one further thing about that is, is that it's accessible as well. So one of the first pull requests that was done against the Irish tracker app was some person who had decided that they had noticed that the spelling of a town called Cahir which is a small, small town down in, in, the, in the far reaches of, of Ireland. And someone had said, that's not how we spell Cahir Sivine in Cahir Sivine. And I thought, that's amazing. These are citizens who are not just using this app, but they are making it their own. They are engaging with the source code so that they can actually make it more relevant to them. And again, that is one of the primary benefits when we think about how open source can actually impact national agendas in that way. So when we actually look at the idea of, I want to introduce this idea of MindFlex. Sorry, I was just checking the chat there and thank you for, for the comments as we're, as, as we're going through this, I'll keep an eye on them. But when, when we think about this idea of MindFlex, I want to introduce this kind of concept. Um, it was something that I read on Twitter a few weeks ago, right? And it was by a guy called Dave Snowden. I don't know if many of you would be familiar with his work, but he is the um, originator of the Kinevin framework for SenseMaker. And he talks about complex ad adaptive systems. And he talks about how we deal in a complex world, how we need to move towards more experimentation, how we need to move away from this idea that we have all the answers. And it really got me thinking. Now, he mentioned this quote about this idea of, um, I think he was actually referring to the agile community, it gets a bit uh, controversial sometimes. So he, he, was, he was saying something about this idea of stopping mindset and starting to talk about mind flex. And it really hit me because there's an awful lot of conversations that happen around open source mindset, right? Or, or collaborative mindset. But this idea of flexing your mind it got me thinking, how can we actually think about how we flex our ideas about open source and flex other people's ideas about open source in order to accelerate the open source agenda? It reminded me actually of a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, who talked about this idea of being of the ability to hold two opposing ideas in your mind and how that's a first rate, a sign of first rate intelligence. Um, or indeed, James Joyce, an Irish author, and he talked about this idea of having two thinks at the same time. And I started thinking, well, how, how can we use that concept to think about how to create arguments and, and, and narratives and stories around open source that will become even more compelling for people who don't necessarily or haven't grown up in that ecosystem, don't understand the value. So what I want to do now is maybe look at a few examples of how we might think differently or in fact think two things at the same time around open source and how that could help us as we have these discussions um, at a national level in terms of how open source can be used. So the first thing is around this idea of open source and money. And I think this is a really interesting one because there, there are literally two narratives that are happening simultaneously around open source and money. There is a whole kind of set of ideas around the, around the fact that there's not enough money getting to open source maintainers. But there is simultaneously an entire conversation around the idea that there is so much opportunity, commercial opportunity in the open source world that is un, probably unleveraged to the degree that it should be. And so for me, these are two things that are both true simultaneously, but feel a little bit conflicting. There's not enough money. And maybe there's, there's so much money, there's so much opportunity. So it's kind of like this is a prime example of how we need to think about having two things simultaneously and how we need to flex between these ideas and between these narratives as we talk to people because it is both true that there's a huge amount of opportunity and commercial opportunity in the open source world but at the same time we need to make sure that the 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 cash that's in the ecosystem gets to the right people gets to maintainers at the same time but having that conversation the right conversation in the right place at the right time with the right people can really help impact and drive forward the whole uh, agenda and discussion the second thing is this idea of open source i want to say versus proprietary code because again there is there are two ways and two kinds of conversations that happen around this. 
there are a group of people who believe that open source should always be the case. We should make everything open. We should use open source software. It should be open source only and always. There's another group of people and often a lot of the people who are just getting into open source, they, they feel more comfortable with this mix of open source and proprietary code. They see more opportunity in that respect, or perhaps they just can't be you know, persuaded to move off their favorite proprietary platform that they potentially are, are using for, for, um, for whatever, they're, whatever they're doing. But this idea that there are two ways to look at this is important because both are valid. It is true that there is a group of people who will only who want to push forward the open source agenda so dramatically that they will, you know, they, they have chosen to use open source all the time. But that should not block people who want to mix their use of open source and proprietary code from participating in the open source community. So for me, this is another example of two things. Both should be both should be possible, both should be supported, and both are our valid approaches to how we use open source and both should feel welcome in the open source world. Also around the path to open source, because um, from my perspective, there again are two narratives that I've heard around this. Uh, there is this idea that we could, that people should jump directly to open source. When, uh, when we think about that, we should make sure that people get directly into GitHub, they should be contributing to the community. But there's a second path that people are exploring. And that's this idea of using inner source as a path to open source. Now, inner source being taking the methods of open source and the practices that, are, that have emerged around the collaboration around open source and bringing it inside the firewall and using it to develop proprietary code. And I happen to be involved with inner source commons and um, primarily actually because I see it as a way to help corporations accelerate their development, even if they're not doing open source. And I know that a lot of organizations who've gotten involved in inner source are doing it to help help them on a path to open source. And of course, the more people that are actually learning how to collaborate, how to actually develop in an open way, the more likely and easy it is for them to take the path to open source. So in many respects, again, both are valid approaches. This is a two think thing. We can both provide opportunities for people to jump into open source or and or both um, use inner source as a path to open source. So it's important to understand that these are two things that can happen. And depending on your context, one might be easier than the other. And we want to make sure there is as many easy paths into open source as possible. And now this one that comes close to my heart, this idea of open source and diversity. I have spent many long hours in conversations and panel sessions and working groups around diversity in tech. I've, I've spent over 20, nearly 25 years now in the tech industry. And this is a constant challenge, right? This idea of um, diversity from all perspectives, uh, gender, but also marginalized groups of all types. And I've noted that in the open source community, there are again, two discussions that happen around this. First of all, you know, it's pretty obvious from various different discussions that there are scenarios where open source community have issues with diversity inclusion, that not every project as is as either diverse or as, as inclusive as we'd like. On the other hand, open source, I see open source as a huge opportunity to increase diversity and inclusion. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I've been in the tech industry for over 25 years or nearly 25 years now. And for the last number of decades, I have never even attempted to actually develop any code. And yet it was my, through my participation with the inner source commons community that, and because they work in an open way, that I had my first experience of actually setting up a GitHub account, creating PORs, committing code, making changes to the website. And I remember when I first did that, I got such a high from it. I actually rang up Denise Cooper, who's the president in, in inner source commons. And I was like, this is amazing. I don't understand why everyone isn't promoting open source as a way into tech, because that was such a positive experience. The community were so helpful. It was actually fun. And when I think about that, and I think about the idea that people in Ireland were able to suggest changes to the app that made it their own, I can't but see the potential for so many people to have a pathway into tech and into development 
that doesn't rely on them going through a computer science degree and us solving all the problems that are in that system in terms of getting marginalized groups through education systems so they can get involved in the tech industry. The open source community seems to provide an opportunity for more paths in that direction. And I think that we should exploit those and try to investigate those as much as we can, while at the same time not forgetting that work has to be done in the open source community at the same time to make sure that we make it as diverse and inclusive as possible. And of course, you know, that's a problem in, across the tech industry. So it's a problem everywhere, but, um, but the two things can be true at the same time. So it's another to think scenario. And the last one I want to come to is this idea of the open source definition, because, and this is, this is probably one that you all know, but from the outside, I feel that there's still this perception of open source as just being the license. So certainly even, even among um, university researchers that I would have talked to who, have, um, who are keen to actually work in the open, they even get to the point where they understand that they need to choose a license and all the rest of it, but they don't quite understand the concept or how to build a community around the about the source code that they make open or available through open source licenses. So there is this notion that we can chuck it over the wall and that's all that I need to do, which of course we all know is not the case. So for me, there's work to be done to make sure that people understand that there are two ways to think about open source. There is open source as a license, the open source code, but then there are these practices around community and collaboration that are important. And I will go as far as to say that actually, this is beyond two things, it's actually three things. I'm, going to, I'm flexing the whole idea of two things here, but if we go to three things and think about the idea of the open source ecosystem itself being a complex system, and when we think about open source, we think about this idea of a system and how do we support that system? How do we create enable it? How do we create supported scaffolding to actually help the open source system thrive? Well, that brings us back to this idea that Dave Snowden has introduced me to, which would be around the idea of complex adaptive systems and how do we support and scaffold them? When I think about that in the context of the open source community, it's how I became enamored with this whole idea of taking the open source program office concept that is so familiar in the corporate world and taking it to universities and taking it to municipalities. And it's how I got involved with Moss Labs who are working on this very problem and bringing together people who both want to set up OSPOs in universities and municipalities, but also connect those people so that the network and the sum of the individuals is, is bigger than each, the sum of the parts is, is bigger than each individual part. So let's have a look at this idea. Again, I know that everyone here today has heard a lot about OSPO services and corporate OSPO offices and what it can do. They typically look at everything from internal policies and um, making sure that things are compliant and being a center of excellence for that, measuring open source activity within organizations, educating people around how to do best practices, managing relationships um, between individuals within a corporation and perhaps foundations, and this idea of advocacy and communications around the whole open source movement. So they'd be fairly familiar to folks who might have been on this, um, this particular track in All Things Open. But if we think about OSPO++, this concept is taking the idea of an OSPO, bringing it to both universities and municipalities or public sector organizations, perhaps expanding it to include all things open because particularly in, in municipalities, but also in universities, these things are broader, open source provide, is, is a smaller part of a bigger open discussion. So when we think about things like open data and open hardware and open standards and open innovation practices and open scholarship, these are all things that need to be included and taken together. And then not only are we taking that concept and expanding it in that respect, but we're also thinking about adding in this idea of it being an interface to other open source program offices in other universities and other municipalities so that you have this network effect whereby each individual node on the network can operate as an individual node 
but also is are, are they're all connected so they're sharing best practices scaling what they do and also identifying opportunities for collaboration that can again bring everyone forward much quicker now that's not as common or wouldn't be as necessary in a corporate world where people are thinking about it from a you know a corporation perspective but in the public sector world in universities and municipalities it becomes incredibly important so what would the benefits be well in my mind it helps to scale citizen services so i mentioned blue tests earlier as being the paris open source services that were created in Paris, were brought to Baltimore and implemented there so that um, you know, more citizens in Baltimore could, could avail of their benefits. More recently, I think it's been taken by Budapest and many of the services have been stood up in a very short period of time with very few resources. That's what we're talking about. There are so many big problems to solve in the world that no one organization could possibly do it by themselves. So why wouldn't we share that and help scale citizen services? Second thing is this idea that we mentioned about research translation. For me, the idea that we provide an alternative path to the traditional path of IP licensing and monetization is incredibly important. And not just make people aware that that is a path, but support them on taking that path and making it an easy default option in certain circumstances, not for everything, because there will always be scenarios where it still makes sense to go that more traditional route of IP licensing that has become so embedded in the university systems. But certainly for anything that had a, had a, has a huge opportunity for social good, why wouldn't you take a more open approach? It allows people to actually gain value from that huge amount of software that's created within a university that is never going to get licensed. And particularly when we look at speed and response that needs to happen very quickly, like, for example, responding to the COVID pandemic, this becomes an incredibly important point. And as I mentioned, I firmly believe that open source skills are the skills for the future, not just to provide or to build open source code, but those collaboration skills, things like conflict resolution, community building, um, policy making, everything that surrounds the open source ecosystem, they're such important skills for a broader set of people to have. And so for me, when I think about innovation and I think about, you know, sometimes what feels like a relatively narrow set of skills that we are creating to address the opportunity that innovation can bring, I think that these cross disciplinary areas that open source touches on could really, really help the whole industry if we think about that at the broader level for skills for the future. And then this idea of transparency and trust. An open source program office in municipalities and in universities could help increase the trust, the transparency, first of all, and as a result, the trust that citizens and a broader set of people have, the trust they have in technology. And that becomes so important. And this is cropping up all over the place. I mean, it's not just in terms of the COVID tracker app that I was mentioning earlier, but this breakdown of trust between citizens and people who are providing them the solutions that are helping to make their lives better. We need to recreate trust. We need to find other ways to build that trust. Or we'll have a scenario where, where people will reject the technology that we're trying to build perhaps not for them, but what we should do is build it with them so that they feel engaged, so that they feel like they're part of the future that is being built around the technology industry. So I suppose I'll finish up now just to say, um, as I mentioned, I'm working with Moss Labs who are doing amazing work, bringing together a community of people who are interested in setting up open source program offices in universities and municipalities. Um, they've managed to bring together an amazing group of people. There are already collaborations happening in that network um, between institutions. I'm, I'm delighted to say that Ireland has um, the Lero, which is the Irish Software Research Centre, has launched its own OSPO and has already started doing joint uh, proposals for, for, for projects with other universities within the network. Um, we're looking at skills programmes we can, we can put in place with collaboration from some of the universities that are already experienced in this in the US. This is an amazing opportunity for us all to learn from each other and to accelerate this whole agenda. So if you are interested in 
being part of that, learning more and um, finding out about whether or not this is for you or what the first steps might be to take, then I would really encourage you to reach out to either me on LinkedIn, you can actually just text here, or you can email info at moxlabs.io, and we would be delighted to hear from you um, and to see how we can actually work together uh, to make open source much more impactful, not just get more of it, but make it much more impactful in the world and to help build those those structures and those pathways for amazing collaborations between open source program offices in governments and municipalities in the future.